All right, here we go, the much-anticipated introductory lecture. You guys are going to love every minute of this. <laughs> Thinking historically and seven or more useful tools for doing it. Uh, so, uh, this lecture uh, is designed uh, to give you some helpful uh, tips, tools. Uh, think of uh, the concepts, uh, the methods uh, that we're going to talk about that historians use to understand the past uh, as tools. Uh, and you're going to have a, a full toolkit uh, by the time we're finished here uh, so that uh, as we go unit by unit, chapter by chapter through the class, uh, you can dig into your toolkit. And I, and I mean it, uh, your you know uh, uh, proverbial toolkit uh, to help you to understand the material. So, Seven useful tips uh, or tools uh, for studying uh, uh, history. Uh, I start with history as a whodunit mystery, uh, which will get us into facts uh, and, more importantly, interpretation of facts, interpreting the evidence. Next, uh, context, context, context. Uh, knowing uh, causes and consequences to promote an overall understanding. Again, uh, unpack all of these things. The ubiquity of unintended consequences. Unintended consequences are everywhere in the study of history. Of course, there are intended consequences as well, uh, but those are easier to uh, find. Uh, and the more illuminating, I think, are, are the unintended consequences. Um, what changes? What stays the same? Change and continuity. How do we sort that out? How do we know what changes and what stays the same? What should change? What should stay the same, if anything at all? Um, we need to look at causes and consequences, cause and effect, uh, and meaning, uh, and uh, uh, significance, which you don't have here, but it's on another slide later on. Significance is a big word uh, in the study of history, particularly for college students. Uh, more on that later. The dangers of presentism. Uh, presentism uh, can be a thorny problem because we're all naturally inclined to do it. So uh, we'll have to deal uh, with this uh, as well. Uh, also uh, in there, not listed, uh, but uh, we'll talk about some, uh, uh, are problems of objectivity and bias in, in history. So, uh, and last kind of a hodgepodge of tools, the uses of theory, speculation, thought experiments, uh, comparison, convergence of evidence, uh, etc. Et so, uh, again, if you pay attention to this and take notes, or go back to it and study, you'll do well on the, hopefully do well on the introductory quiz, which is uh, uh, testing you on this, five questions. But as I said uh, earlier, or in another uh, uh, recording. If you study this and go back to it later in the class or throughout the class, uh, as these terms, these tools, these concepts come up again and again and again, as terminology comes up, you'll understand the course better. You'll understand, you know, the Constitution better. You'll understand the presidency of George Washington better. You'll understand. Bacon's Rebellion, better, and on and on and on. So uh, there's a short-term, straightforward reason to pay attention here. Uh, you get some points by you know, doing well on the quiz. Not a lot, but enough to do it. But more importantly, there's long-term indirect payoff uh, because this really is uh, uh, a, an expensive or valuable toolkit uh, for studying history. So history is a whodunit mystery from facts or the what's and sort of when, where, uh, to the interpretation, uh, the why or the how of history involving the analysis of evidence. Who's that uh, a little cartoon character there? That's, of course, Sherlock Holmes, uh, the most famous fictional detective of all time. So we ask questions about the past to get answers. In fact, a very oft-used phrase in historical study is historical inquiry, right? An inquiry uh, is sort of an, you know, a, a series of questions or inquiring about this or that. 
In this case, we're asking questions about the past. And in fact, having a detective, uh, uh, you know, cartoon figure or not on the screen is more apropos than you may think. Historical study, uh, what historians do, is actually quite a bit like what detectives do. Uh, look at Sherlock Holmes through his little glass there looking at uh, uh, footprints. Well, when were those footprints put, put there? Tomorrow? Uh, right now? Uh, no, they, they were there when he got there, so it was in the past. Yes, the, the recent past, like last night or something. Nonetheless, what detectives are investigating, whatever, their, whatever the case is, whatever type of crime it is, uh, it happened in the past. And they're trying to piece together uh, uh, an understanding of what happened in what order, uh, uh, you know, what happened first, and then uh, this happened, and then this, and this, to piece together, uh, right, uh, as much of the past as possible to get answers to things uh, that are relevant in the present. So this is a great deal uh, like uh, what historians actually do. It's just historians are asking questions uh, about things that happened, trying to inquire into uh, and get answers about uh, events that happened hundreds uh, of years ago. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, it is uh, uh, it is quite similar in other ways uh, as well. Historians uh, look for motive, uh, trying to understand why uh, certain uh, leaders uh, did this, why certain groups uh, did that uh, in history. Just like in a murder murder case, uh, you know, detectives, uh, the, the district attorneys are always going to try to find motive uh, for the for the crime. So uh, history is a whodunit mystery, uh, and uh, from facts to interpretation. More on our interpretation uh, now. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I forgot about this. Uh, and this is an important stop. Uh, primary source. Documents, the foundation of historical study. Uh, and that really is true. If anything, I'm understating it. And documents often look like that. Uh, sort of messy and sort of thrown around, sometimes super, super old, hundreds or thousands of years, depending on what it is. You know, catacombs uh, under the Vatican in Rome. And if an historian wants to uh, you know, study the Vatican or the history of the papacy, they're going to, at some point, probably have to dig through the stacks uh, like this, or even uh, older, with dust you know, all over them, uh, and try to uh, you know, make sense uh, of the documents. So what are primary source documents you know, uh, specifically? Uh, the definition is quite simple. It's anything that's written down uh, that, that survived from the time period that you're inquiring into or studying. So if it's the Roman Empire that you're studying, anything that was written down in any way that survived uh, uh, is a primary source document. So letters and papers and you know, uh, uh, diaries, uh, official government documents, uh, graffiti even uh, sometimes, uh, newspapers, depending on the time period. If it's uh, numbers, facts and figures, receipts, uh, tax records, etc., uh, etc., et inventories of goods, uh, you know, uh, commodities, all of those things are primary source documents. Whether or not they're valuable or not depends uh, on a number of variables, including what the historian is studying about the past, ancient Rome or whatever it is. But make no mistake about it, the meat and potatoes of historical study is primary source documents. Ninety. Five ninety-eight percent of what historians use to know anything about the past at all uh, are primary source documents. If there weren't you know, professional historians, uh, that's not my. That's not. I'm an historian too, but I retired from the primary source document business after graduate school. Uh, but if there weren't hundreds, thousands of historians dedicated to primary source document research, we do not. We'd know nothing about the past. Nothing, or a tiny, tiny bit about the past. Uh, so what I do is cheat. Uh, I read books written by brilliant researchers and historians who do go through the stacks in painstaking, boring, 
uh, fashion, uh, oftentimes with little reward until, aha, I found you know something that I was looking for, or didn't realize it was going to be here. What a what a find! Uh, so, so I cheat and I read their books, uh, and they they include excerpts from the prime minister's documents in the form of quotations, and include uh, end notes and bibliographies that allow you to know exactly uh, where the documents are located, like in one of these pictures here. Uh, so uh, I uh, rely on others, and so will you. Uh, everything I know, ultimately, uh, almost everything, ultimately goes back to primary source documents, primary sources. Uh, everything that's in our textbook relies on primary source documents. Uh, so uh, it, it is uh, the meat and potatoes uh, of the study of history. Now, interpretation. History as the interpretation of what happened in the past from the primary source documents and uh, uh, other, other forms of evidence. There are some other forms. We're not going to get into that uh, uh, today. Uh, and as uh, one famous historian, uh, uh, Johann Zinga, expert on the Middle Ages, said uh, long ago, history is the interpretation of the significance the past has for us. Hold on to the word significance. We'll come back to that later on. So, interpretation uh, is when you move from the facts, and we can oftentimes, as I'm sure you know, ascertain the facts, like what happened and what you know, when was it, when did it happen, and where did it happen. But it's when we go from make the move from the facts to interpreting them, meaning trying to make some sense of them, that history starts to leave the realm of the kind of neat and clean, like, you know, names and dates and memorizing stuff, which most people think is what history is completely, they're wrong, because uh, once you start to ask questions about, okay, what do all these facts mean? Uh, what are we supposed to, what are they telling us? Then you get into interpretation, uh, and different interpretive narratives uh, crop up, lots of them, uh, because different historians, different scholars, different intellectuals uh, look at the same evidence and read it differently and say, I think it, what it, it's saying mostly this. Uh, no, I think it's saying mostly that. So uh, there are different uh, uh, analyses of the same evidence uh, most of the time. Uh, so interpretation really is, not really, it, it is always arguable, and it's never certain. That's not to say there are no objective truths. There are, or I strongly believe that there are. Uh, but we sometimes can't know for sure what what is objectively true in the study of history. So it's a bit odd. If Let's uh, use as an example of interpretation. Uh, let's say it's a, a two historians writing books on World War II, and not just the, you know, the entirety of World War II, but they're writing books about D-Day uh, and the uh, battle for Normandy that lasted for about a month after D-Day, June 6, 1944. So we can establish and have established lots of facts about uh, uh, D-Day. It happened on June 6, 1944. That's a fact. Uh, and we know, uh, you know thousands of other facts about it. Lots of evidence uh, left behind uh, in the form of uh, you know, documentary evidence, as already mentioned, but other things uh, uh, as well. But what are we supposed to take away from all of that? So let's say two historians, uh, one at Harvard, one at Yale, uh, are writing a book about D-Day and the following invasion, uh, uh, the, the battle for Normandy over the next month, as the allies, mostly Americans and British, started to push uh, Nazi German forces back uh, uh, through and eventually out of uh, occupied France. So let's say, for the most part, for sake of argument, the two historians, in telling the story about D-Day and what happened, kind of, you know, this happened and this and this, they pretty much tell you the same story, as they would likely do. But let's say in the last chapter, each one of them devoted the last chapter to asking and trying to answer a question. Uh, and the question that they both asked uh, was uh, how important uh, was D-Day uh, and the subsequent invasion, of, you know, push across uh, the fields and villages of Normandy by the Americans and their British allies in winning the war? Uh, 
uh, how big of a role did that play? Uh, and his, the historian from Harvard, uh, in his last chapter, answers the question by saying, far and away, hands down, easily, it's the single most uh, important uh, reason uh, that Nazi Germany was defeated. And the professor from Yale, who's studied the exact same you know, uh, uh, facts, looked at many of the same documents, though there's millions of documents of World War II, uh, and told more or less the same story about what did happen. When he asked that question in his final chapter, says the most important factor in the defeat of Nazi Germany was what the Soviet Red Army was doing on the Eastern Front, and at best, what the Allies, the Americans and British were doing on the Western Front in France was a sideshow, was an assist. Uh, by the way, both of those interpretations uh, uh, are real, even though I'm kind of using them in a hypothetical sense here. But that debate really does go, does go on. So how do we know which one is right? We don't. I could read both books and be you know, convinced that the historian from Harvard that thinks the U.S. and the British deserve most of the credit is right, and you might read both books and think that the other guy is, is right. And so now you and I have the same interpretive disagreement that the two authors uh, or historians do. Let's say there were a uh, hundred people you know, asking and answering that question. And sometimes uh, there's, th th there's clutter uh, in, in some of these subjects. Uh, so... Or let's say you know a few dozen historians that weigh in on this question, and they'd all have somewhat different answers uh, to the to the question. Now, some of them might be very close uh, in fundamental agreement, uh, close enough we might group them together. So, okay, these guys think this, this group thinks that, and there's another group over here uh, that kind of cuts it down the the middle. So there's not always just you know this or that interpretation. Sometimes there are many of them, and the way the human mind works uh, and the way it relates to the physical world, it's not always possible, uh, and it's usually not in history, uh, to, to be able to say for sure which interpretation is the correct one. So if we have dozens of books uh, answering that question uh, about you know how important was D-Day and the invasion uh, subsequently, let's say it's 50. 50 books. Uh, one of the authors is closest to right, but the problem is we can't know for sure which one it is. Uh, we can think we do. Uh, we can be pretty certain. We can be confident in our view that you know this one is correct or closer to correct than any others, and we could be right, but we're not going to be able to likely prove that we're right. Part of it is that there are so many variables when it comes to historical events and you know, social events in the present uh, as, as well. So once you get from facts and make the move to interpretation, you get into much murkier water. History becomes more opaque, less clear. Uh, students sometimes find this to be disappointing because they thought history was sort of neat and clean and memorizing facts. And they find, wow, it's uh, full of disagreements that are ongoing and sometimes, uh, you know, just keep going. Uh, and we, it's hard to know uh, for certain you know, what the, the objective truth is. But remember, I, I do not believe uh, that the truth is relative. I'm not making a relativistic argument because I don't believe that relativism uh, uh, makes sense. Uh, so there is an objective truth. We just can't always uh, 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 know what it is for sure. It's just like I, I used the, the crime uh, uh, detective analogy before. If a murder was committed, uh, we know that a murder happened, but we can't always figure out who did it. Uh, does, if we can't figure out who did it, does that mean uh, there, there's it's relative? Uh, anyone could have done it? No, not anyone could have done it. One person or you know, a group of people did it, uh, uh, but we just don't know who it is uh, at this point anyway. So, uh, again, uh, objective truths uh, in history uh, uh, are there. It's just like a, a, a crime. We can't always uh, uh, know uh, right to, uh, how to explain uh, what happened, how to uh, uh, you know, assign uh, sort of interpretive you know, uh, elements like causation and you know, why things happened, how they happened.
Context, context, context. Understanding the setting is a critical element in the process of historical study. And forgive my cheesy little setup here uh, with the little blue panels that I put. did this rather quickly a number of years ago. Uh, I should make a better one, but I guess I'm lazy. Uh, so uh, this is an example of uh, a context, a simple one. Uh, but simple examples sometimes are the best uh, because of clarity. So you see a, a picture of what appears to be a, a, a guy. He has his mouth open. Uh, and it, it uh, we can't tell too much more than that. We can speculate. Uh, but with the picture, and you, you know it's under the blue, of course, the full picture, but without the picture uh, around him, of what's, uh, what's around him, it's hard to know what exactly he's doing there. Why does he have his mouth wide open? Is he ecstatically happy? Uh, is he uh, yelling at somebody? Uh, and the photograph just happened to, uh, you know, catch him in a split second uh, and make look like he was you know, happy when he was actually screaming at somebody in anger? Could he be in a state of, uh, I don't know, religious euphoria? Uh, could he be uh, in a choir uh, and he's singing an extremely high note? Uh, uh, all of those things are possible. You've probably guessed what it is already. So another reason why this isn't the best example uh, to make the point. Uh, but it, it, it sur uh, suffices nonetheless. Because once we see this, and you probably did guess it, or this, uh, right? Uh, now we can know much more uh, about this person and what he's up to. It's clear that he's at uh, a public gathering. It looks like a sporting event, though it could be a political rally uh, as well, uh, uh, which I do think sometimes when I look at this picture. By the way, I don't know what this is. I I'm, I'm, I'm asking those questions or speculating because I, I actually don't know. I just grabbed this and thought, okay, this will work. So I still don't. I still don't know. I don't know if that's inside or outside. Looks like an indoor stadium to me. Uh, baseball, uh, uh, you know, basketball, football, political rally, concert. No idea. But you have some better idea certainly now uh, by seeing the context. Context is sort of what's behind, what's around. Now, in history, it's not always about what's around a person in history. I'm just, again, this is an analogy, uh, but it can be. So uh, to understand George Washington in history, I like to understand at least something about what this guy's doing here, the picture. It helps to know uh, about George Washington's family, helps to know where he came from, helps to know about his, uh, you know, uh, the, the past uh, in his family and in the region he uh, grew up in was going on economically, politically in his uh, early life, socially, culturally in his early life. And the same is true of events as well. So if we're to understand Shay's Rebellion, uh, and for you, uh, practically speaking, when you study, if Shay's Rebellion is a study guide term, uh, what the hell is Shay's Rebellion? What's important about that? Well, back up. Uh, don't focus so much just on Shay's Rebellion, but to take the camera back, like see here, uh, and look at it from a wider angle. What's going on around Shay's Rebellion? And you have a better chance of understanding it. So context, in some ways, is everything in history. Uh, putting things into context uh, uh, is uh, like putting things into greater focus or uh, to keep our uh, uh, you know picture example here alive, uh, to back away. Uh, and see things uh, from a, a broader perspective. The ubiquity of unintended consequences. What does ubiquity mean? Uh, it's I don't know. No, it means uh, kind of uh, everywhere. Uh, if something is ubiquitous, it's all over the place, virtually everywhere. Uh, and uh, unintended consequences crop up uh, a great deal in history. And in fact, if you get used to uh, or force yourself to get good at seeing them and finding them, you'll probably find some in our textbook in some of our units that I haven't even thought of before. So <clears throat> they're not just a, you know, a prescribed list of unintended consequences. Uh, there's lots of possibilities here. And 
unintended consequences often help us to understand some of the quirks in history in that and and some of the long-term developments in history so that something happens in one time period <coughs> for a certain set of reasons and they cause something momentous say 300 years later you know more less uh, momentous in a good way or bad way uh, that the people that set those events in motion you know, 300 years before, had no idea uh, uh, was going to lead to that. I mean, they, they wouldn't have, couldn't have uh, uh, realized that that was where it was headed. Uh, I like the little cartoon of the guy sitting there knocking over the domino. Uh, and uh, These look like heavy, like slabs of concrete dominoes. Uh, and what he doesn't know is he's just committed suicide. Uh, because, uh, right, uh, uh, he didn't, well, unless, he, unless he's trying to commit suicide, uh, but uh, if he's not, the unintended consequence of knocking over that domino, <coughs> excuse me, is that he's going hit, to get hit by a domino. I need to take a sip of drink here. It's just Coca-Cola. Don't get all uptight. All right. Let's move on. What changes and what stays the same? Change and continuity. This is something that's uh, always a messy process in history. Lots of messiness in history we're finding out tonight. Uh, time, change, continuity. All change occurs over time. There is continuity to the basic structure of a society. Uh, and in order to understand any society, uh, people, place, at a given time uh, in history, uh, it is important to try to sort some of these things out. What's what's staying the same and why if it stays the same it's partly likely that it, because it works in some way maybe not for everybody uh it works for a certain group that has power uh, might be horribly unjust to another group of people but it works uh, for those that uh you know want whatever staying the same to stay the same uh so uh we have it helps us to understand again uh any society in the past if we know what what the features of continuity are and to what degree are things staying the same uh, to what degree is there change and if there's like more change than continuity why uh, uh, what what's what's going on does history repeat itself uh, uh, it sort of is a related question uh, Mark Twain said it doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes uh, so uh, is there really true continuity uh, well, there's no doubt that certain things change. Right? We know technology changes over time, so there are some things that change. And the world as a whole changes. I mean, you know, human beings, at least socially and culturally, change, at least to some degree over time. Though they do have the power to, at the very least, slow it down, maybe even considerably, uh, if there's a concerted effort uh, to maintain tradition, which is continuity. Uh, uh, you know, by enough people with enough power uh, to do so. Uh, understanding the process of development uh, to know how we got from there to here, uh, right, uh, is also about change. So development uh, and process, uh, those are both important words uh, that you might want to put in your toolkit uh, uh, to uh, think about. So the processes of change, you know, development uh, over time, uh, gradual uh, evolutionary change, cultural evolution uh, is a tool that historians uh, use, picked up from uh, uh, evolutionary biology and other related subjects, but can be useful in understanding uh, uh, history. Is change always a good thing? We live in a society and uh, time when were, I think, pretty much uh, sold, or at least the attempt is to sell us on the idea that change is always good. But I think it's pretty clear that it only takes a couple of seconds of thought to realize, well, that not theoretically, it can't be true that all change is a good thing. There can be good changes and there can be bad changes. So it depends. So should societies always change? Uh, uh, it, Again, it depends on a lot of different variables and factors. But I do think we tend to underestimate uh, uh, how much tradition uh, 
uh, uh, can actually be uh, uh, a good thing. Uh, we tend to think of it as, oh, if it's, if it's traditional, it's backward, uh, and it's sort of behind the times. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's had its day. Uh, it just can't seem to, uh, 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 you know, uh, it, it just can't seem to have any new ideas. Uh, but uh, all of us and all societies do need, I think, some elements uh, of continuity uh, uh, to make us sort of feel at home, to make us uh, feel safe, uh, to make us uh, uh, happy. Uh, so uh, change, of course, can be a good thing, and we'll see plenty of examples of important positive changes in American history. But we'll see some important, uh, I think, examples of uh, tradition uh, uh, asserting itself and saying, oh, no, no, uh, if, if something is uh, good, uh, why not preserve it? Uh, assuming that it's still good, you know, uh, in the present as it was uh, in the past. But again, it de sometimes depends on who we're talking about. Uh, what's you know good to keep uh, traditional and, and con continuous for one person and one group is not necessarily uh, uh, good for another. So uh, it's a thorny issue. Causes and consequences. Meaning and significance. One of the big things that historians do, difficult task, is try to unravel what caused World War One, as you see here. Uh, consequences of the Protestant Reformation, although it's causes and consequences in that book. The significance of the frontier in American history on the right. Very, very famous book uh, and thesis, the Turner Thesis by Frederick Jackson Turner, which we'll actually get to later in, in the class. Uh, these are the things we, we won't. Uh, Holocaust memorials and meaning. Uh, uh, the texture of memory. We won't talk about that subject either, but I just wanted the word meaning. Uh, so historians uh, uh, look for causes, you know, why something happened, consequences, uh, what was the result uh, of certain events, uh, you know, sometimes unintended result. Uh, can we find meaning in certain events in history? Uh, and uh, what's the significance? I mentioned at the outset that significance we'd come back to and that it was a big word uh, in historical study, especially for students. The reason being is that it's a good, uh, simple way uh, to get at studying. So whenever you're confronted with a study guide term in this class or any other history class, you got to think about significance. So if it's George Washington, since I've already been using him as an example, I'm trying to think, well, what the hell's so important about George Washington? Why do we need to? Why do we need to study this guy? He's in our textbook, and this professor guy is talking about him a lot. Who cares? Good question. Who cares? The answer to that question is is probably what you need to know. What what's important? What's so important about George Washington, or what's so significant about George Washington? <coughs> Great question. If you can answer that question, uh, you probably uh, know something uh, that's important uh, and that will serve you well uh, on exams. And it's not just people. It's events. Uh, what's uh, significant or important about the Battle of Yorktown? Uh, uh, well, uh, if you say nothing, uh, that's probably not going to get you anywhere. Uh, but if you can sort of think clearly uh, and somewhat deeply about what's significant or important about uh, this or that. Uh, uh, it, it's a great aid to studying. Uh, and this is something well known in the historical profession. The dangers of presentism and our arrogance towards the past. Presentism is a difficult problem. Uh, not everybody sees it as a problem, uh, uh, but uh, the historical profession for a long time did. I think it's less seen as a problem today. I still see it as, a, as an issue uh, uh, that's uh, important to, to, to grapple with. It's partly a problem a dif a, or difficulty because all of us have a tendency to do it naturally. So in order to combat this at all, uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of conscious effort uh, uh, to do. Professional historians who should know better, uh, sometimes brilliant ones at Harvard and you know, Stanford and uh, you know, New York University, commit the sin of presentism all the time. Uh, 
Uh, and, th and people that do that don't really, don't usually realize that they're doing it. So what is it that's so hard to get away from? Uh, and what does this word presentism mean? It means our tendency, you can see the definition at the bottom. This is one definition. I will read it. Uh, uncritical adherence to present day attitudes, <clears throat> especially the tendency to interpret past events in terms of modern values and concepts. So it's when we, again, naturally, our brains are kind of attuned to doing it, look back into the past, whatever we're looking back to, ancient Rome, say, ancient China, and expect the people then and there uh, to behave uh, or think uh, like we do. Uh, and when we do that, one of the problems is, to me, we're likely to get them wrong because they likely weren't thinking like uh, we are today. Why? Because they lived hundreds of years ago uh, and in some other place. Uh, and uh, their values and norms uh, and attitudes and beliefs were quite different uh, than ours. Plus, we have the advantage of hundreds of years, depending on how far you're going back, of more events happening, more learning taking place, more scholarship and poetry and religious thought uh, uh, to uh, help us understand the human condition and you know uh, human societies. So uh, we have advantages over the past. That's how we can get kind of arrogant towards the past. We look back and say, "Those people in the Middle Ages, oh my God, they you know they burned people at the stake for heresy and you know bogus charges of witchcraft. Uh, what a bunch of lunatics!" Uh, well, that is one way to look at it, and I'm not saying it's for sure wrong, uh, but uh, I think it's uh, it's in some ways shallow at the very least, uh, because again, people in the Middle Ages weren't capable, for the most part, of thinking uh, like we are today. If you walked up and said, uh, you know, to somebody uh, that was you know responsible for putting heretics to death uh, or trying them. To get them put to death, and said, "Hey, Mister uh, Prosecutor, uh, torturer, you're a you're an evil person because you're violating these, violating these people's human rights." The guy would have he wouldn't understand what you're talking. Human what? What are you talking about? The concept of human rights didn't exist uh, in those days. Uh, it came about through long, hard, you know, uh, lives. Uh, suffering, uh, uh, untold suffering through millennia. Uh, and so uh, we have a huge advantage in many ways over uh, people that lived hundreds or more years ago. By the way, the Ben Franklin and glasses is a, of course, kind of a joke version of an uh, 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 example of presentism. Uh, the joke, of course, being it's presentistic because Ben Franklin is wearing glasses that didn't exist. Those are like cop's glasses from the 20th or 21st century. Franklin uh, was an 18th century figure, so it's presentistic uh, in a trivial way, but it makes the point a little a little bit. Uh, there's, I think, sort of a special case, a type of presentism, uh, that's the one that I think uh, can be the, the, the most problematic and the most tricky to deal with. Again, this isn't easy to deal with. All of us who think about history uh, um, can uh, think presentistically, uh, and, and again, in some ways and sometimes it might be okay. I still think it's uh, very much worth uh, uh, checking ourselves, uh, uh, you know, uh, and understanding that that's what we're doing uh, before we sort of, you know, accept it, uh, even if we end up accepting presentistic thinking in the end, at least in specific cases. But the, the, the more uh, s specific uh type of presentism that we see a lot is, and this is where we get back to arrogance, we tend to look back into the past and judge people, not just individuals, but, you know, groups of people and times and places, like in the Middle Ages. We judge them arrogantly. We judge them morally. Uh, they were terrible people uh, for, you know, persecuting heretics uh, in the, the Middle Ages. And so when we apply uh, moral value judgments to people in the past who oftentimes couldn't have known uh, or had other 
other things getting in the way that we're not taking into consideration and we probably should. Again, like context. What was the context? What were the consequences for that person or group of people uh, if they had behaved differently? Uh, what, were the, what were the constraints on them uh, that kept them uh, uh, or made it more difficult for them to do what we want them to do? Which is, hey, don't, don't you know, burn heretics at the stake. Let them believe what they want to believe. Uh, well, there were lots of constraints getting in the way of that. One is that the idea was just not there. Uh, uh, but there might have been other constraints as well. So until, if we want to be really responsible in studying history, and you know I do, uh, I guess you don't have to be, but we have to, I think, grapple with this issue and not just glibly uh, uh, denounce uh, people or groups of people or whole societies in the past uh, because they didn't do things like we do uh, today. Uh, so, uh, Again, it's it's an it's a difficult issue. Uh, another problem uh, in uh, studying history, uh, one I'm kind of uh, getting us off on a sidetrack uh, here a little bit, just because it wasn't on the original outline, uh, is the question of objectivity and bias. Uh, I'm not going to go into these questions, but uh, it might be interesting for you to do your, your, yourself. The author whose uh, name shows up in parentheses in the quotation is really the world's foremost expert or very close to it uh, on what we call cognitive fallacies or cognitive biases uh, and so there are some biases and that's the kind that Daniel Kahneman uh, here for years has studied that are inherent uh, that the that there are, our brains are automatically prone to certain biases that our, our brains make little errors here and there that sometimes can have, they're little, but they can have huge consequences, uh, often negative. Uh, and the only way we can correct them uh, is to be aware of them and, again, make a conscious effort uh, uh, to uh, you know, weed them out once we know uh, what they are uh, and identify them uh, as such. Uh, but if you read that quote uh, and think about the answer, uh, and uh, look at the little uh, math problem there uh, and think about the answer. If you are interested in, in what this means, uh, what what's the point here with in terms of uh, a, a sort of inherent natural uh, uh, bias sort of getting in the way of the right answer for either of these? Uh, let me know. Uh, I'll come back. To, I'll come back to it. But so I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit. Objectivity means that you are not approaching a subject with preconceived notions, or at least you're checking your preconceived notions at the door and looking at it honestly, uh, and looking at it from the evidence, looking at it from it rationally, and not allowing emotion, not allowing uh, your own uh, interests, not allowing your own beliefs or ideological predilections, uh, to get in the way. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are neutral. Uh, uh, you might take a side. In fact, you might even take a sharp uh, one-sided, uh, uh, you know, make a one-sided conclusion uh, to something uh, and still be objective. Because as long as you make a good faith effort to analyze the evidence uh, and, you know, the question uh, issue on its merits and not with bias, whether of the you know, inherent kind, Kahneman studies, uh, or kind of learned biases, political biases and religious biases or the learned ones. Uh, but as long as you can put those aside, at least long enough to analyze uh, issues uh, and evidence, again, on their merits, uh, then you're being objective, whatever you conclude. Uh, so if, if you honestly conclude that the answer is this, that's on one side, you know, an extreme side of the issue, uh, you've, you've still stayed objective if you've honestly uh, uh, you know, analyzed it uh, uh, on its merits with bias sort of shoved aside. One current scholar says uh, somewhat humorously, but I think he's right, that the, the most trustworthy uh, work of scholarship is the one where a guy or woman uh, goes uh, to study something with 
a, a certain idea in mind, kind of a one-sided approach to it, uh, hoping that they're thinking that they're going to get these answers and, and already biased to get those answers. But through the process of sifting through the evidence, in whatever field, history, whatever else, sociology, take your pick, they, they see that the evidence is on the other side. And their, their study then takes a completely different turn, and the original thesis they thought they were going to have, the original conclusion, turns about out to be the opposite uh, of the one they started with. And, and the current scholar that pointed this out you know, says that they're believable because you can tell that they're being ob objective. They were on the other side. They were ready to draw a conclusion uh, that they were already comfortable with, it was already the side they were kind of on, uh, and yet they came to a, a diametrically different conclusion because they were so compelled by the evidence, uh, and they were obviously, uh, uh, you know, it was obviously a person of integrity that felt I have to be honest. I, I can't, I can't, I can't let myself be biased. Not everyone's like that, uh, but the. the Intellectual in question, I think, uh, makes a good point. Those might be the most believable studies. Our minds then are prone to systematic errors in certain circumstances. Uh, that book on the left, published about nine, eight, nine years ago, uh, is like the Bible uh, on uh, these kind of not the learned biases, but the ones that are uh, uh, you know we're, we're born with uh, system one and system two. System one is the kind of automatic part of the brain that kind of gives you an outline of things for quick action, like in prehistoric days when you needed to, you're walking away from the rest of the group by yourself and you were rustling in the bushes uh, and you got about one second to figure out, to you know, conclude whether that's a tiger or whether it's just the wind. Uh, and so system one is necessary because we do have to make fast uh, judgment sometimes. But it does give us kind of just a thumbnail sketch. And so it's prone to errors because it's not about accurate. It's not about detailed accuracy. It's about kind of uh, that sort of general blueprint. Uh, but to do more careful thinking, we have to invoke system two, which doesn't come as naturally. We have the cognitive and rational ability to do so. But this is where we start thinking mathematically and statistically. It doesn't come natural. You have to kind of learn that and grind and grind it out. Uh, but it is necessary. System two is necessary, uh, uh, as Kahneman defines it uh, or labels it, in order to think. Uh, I think clearly enough to draw good historical conclusions, you know, as well as you know, con good conclusions in other related subjects. Theory, speculation, categorization, comparison, convergence of evidence. <coughs> That's a mouthful. Um, historians do uh, profit from uh, uh, using uh, theory, uh, as many uh, fields do. Uh, economists, political scientists. In fact, neorealism on the left is a, a theory in political science, uh, kind of a covering theory, uh, which uh, is a way to... Uh, use a, a theory uh, and its structure uh, to kind of uh, try to stay on the straight and narrow path uh, in uh, drawing conclusions about, you know, uh, historical or, you know, current political economic phenomena. Theory then can be quite useful to the historian, but it can be dangerous too. Theories are seductive partially because they do, in a sense, simplify uh, they take a, a world full of events and facts that sometimes just seem so confusing and disjointed, and they put it in kind of a neat, explainable, simple structure. <coughs> and so it's t sometimes it's tempting, theory that is, because it simplifies. And if it simplifies in a way that's still leading the direction of what's true, then that's a good thing. But if it's simplifying and, and one is drawn to it, just because it makes it simpler to understand, but it's wrong, then of course you see the problem. Uh, so, uh, but theory can be useful. Many historians don't think speculation has any place uh, in the uh, in the discipline of history, uh, but I uh, disagree. Uh, 
uh, to speculate uh, is to think kind of creatively, uh, is to uh, do thought experiments. Uh, as long as you realize, uh, and take it with a grain of salt, realize that well, speculation means you, you're you know you're theorizing, you're hypothesizing without evidence. Theorizing in a more general sense, uh, you're uh, you know sort of doing uh, what if questions. Well, what if uh, this? What if that? Uh, uh, you have to realize that they you know that it can't take you too far. But I still think you can uh, a lot of wisdom can come out of uh, good speculative questions and good uh, speculative uh, trains of reason. Historians categorize things, uh, and uh, sometimes they can do it pedantically, but uh, it's, I think, unnecessary as well. So uh, putting things into categories that make sense does simplify. It could oversimplify again. But if we didn't categorize and label, uh, not just in history but in anything, we could not understand the world. Our brains require some sort of order. Uh, we're kind of like uh, uh, you know uh, intellectual neat freaks. Uh, if it's too messy, we can't understand it. So we have to sort of gather uh, data and information and find a way to uh, tame it somehow, putting it into categories uh, with certain labels and boxes. Uh, and historians uh, need to do this as well. <clears throat> comparisons uh, are big in history. Uh, comparisons uh, are quite important uh, to be able to sort of uh, understand a, you know per current events uh, or uh, something that happened a hundred years ago by comparing it to something that at least appears on the surface to be similar 500 years before that uh, and uh, the, it, it's complicated because uh, sometimes there can be <coughs> similarities between uh, an event that happened then and now but it could be true that someone is seeing the similarities and blind to the differences when in fact there are far more differences than similarities. So comparison is fraught with uh, you know, complexity as well. Nonetheless, it can be a useful tool. Convergence of evidence uh, is a, a phrase from science. Uh, it also uh, is relevant in law. But it uh, simply means that when um, when you have more pieces of evidence kind of of different kinds that lead to the same conclusion, you have a stronger case, you have a stronger argument. So if you have just one type of evidence or one person saying something uh, happened, uh, it's not as strong as if you have numerous sources, you know, from different types of evidence from eyewitness you know, testimony to... Uh, you know, hard uh, evidence, uh, you know, uh, unearthed by archaeologists that have you know found artifacts. Separate types of evidence, many pieces of evidence leading to the same conclusion, uh, is powerful, uh, and it's true in history as it is again science uh, in uh, the law as well. Historical models, categories, patterns. Uh, models uh, are used in economics uh, and political science, uh, many other uh, disciplines. Historians don't use them as much, but they use them to some degree, and sometimes they lean on uh, the ones in other fields. A model uh, is a, a mental construct that's not... not Real. It's not the. It's not true uh, uh, entirely. Uh, it's uh, it, it sort of sets up. It's it's hypothetical. Uh, it sets up something that's possible. It's kind of like an ideal type in a sense, uh, and uh, the model then doesn't reflect reality totally, but it can help get us to a better understanding of reality. So. Uh, Models can be useful in historical study. Uh, patterns, uh, categories we did mention already. Uh, uh, patterns are interesting uh, in history and useful, though they can be you know, dangerously seductive as well. Uh, the example I always use, to me it's one that stands out, but there are others, is that if you study the pattern of financial crises in history, uh, and the guy... Uh, 
whose uh, book you see there, Charles Kindleberger, one of the great uh, uh, scholars uh, on financial crises in history. Uh, he and others have shown, I think, pretty clearly that financial crises tend to unfold in, in very similar ways. Uh, it, 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 there's a pattern uh, that develops. Uh, and so if you can establish that you know, a, 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 lo a long list of financial crises going back in time have many of the same essential features to them, right? Uh, then when you see uh, uh, an event, a financial uh, you know, uh, issue uh, happening uh, in the present or in the more recent past, uh, it, it makes it, I think, easier uh, to explain. Uh, and it, it, it works something like, uh, as it says at the bottom right, legal precedents. Uh, the English common law uh, was, you know, established the uh, the importance of precedent. The United States picked it up from British law, since we're, you know, we we were we were joined at the hip at one point. Great Britain, uh, which our class of course deals with, and the breaking away uh, of uh, uh, that or from that, but the common law in England uh, had precedent as a major feature of the law. And if you don't already know this, many of you may, precedent means that when you're looking for a precedent, you're looking for an earlier court case similar to the one you have now to use it as guidance. And so, okay, okay what was the case then? Very similar, okay. How did they decide that case then? Okay, we're going to use the same reasoning. Uh, and they've kind of given us some help in already putting in some thought on uh, this particular legal uh, issue in question. But again, uh, how much between the two cases is similar, how much is different, that's open to uh, interpretation and differences of opinion. Uh, so uh, this, nonetheless, if you can establish uh, patterns, uh, you know, that, are, that, that seem reasonably, uh, you know, uh, helpful, it, it really can, I think, be a, a useful tool. Uh, Historical experiments with a question mark. Can history do experiments for us? Well, of course, no, not like lab experiments. But sometimes history unfolds accidentally, uh, unintentionally, uh, in a way that it's almost like it uh, did a lab experiment anyway. Uh, and we'll see some examples of it in the, in this class. Uh, uh, so uh, history sometimes it's it's like an experiment happened, uh, and when you can see that and and pick up on uh, the fact that it is, in a sense, mimicking an experiment, that can be a powerful tool as well. But you have to just, you know, be lucky that, you know, such things happen because they're never deliberate experiments. I'm just going to read the title here. Historical methodology does employ important elements of scientific method uh, as much as possible. Uh, one of the great economic historians uh, the 20th century uh, said historical hypotheses are not generally universal propositions. They cannot be falsified by a single exception. Testing them largely means trying to discover the boundaries of the area in which they seem reasonably valid. When research pushes against such boundaries and the deviations from expectations become significant, there are normally two ways of meeting the situation. Either the hypothesis may be discarded, not necessarily as being wrong, although it could be wrong, but having exhausted its explanatory value, or the deviations found uh, can be systematized and incorporated into the hypothesis, thus enriching it and providing stimulus for further research. So, uh, in part, what he's saying here, uh, Alexander Gershenkron is the man's name, uh, is that historians can use and should, uh, in you know many cases, scientific method. Uh, but a lot of historical questions and issues uh, can't uh, sort of be handled exactly uh, how many uh, questions in science can. Falsification coming from Karl Popper in the mid 20th century, great scientific uh, uh, thinker, philosophy of science. Um, falsification was the uh, to him the key uh, to whether something was a scientific question or not. Uh, if you can't falsify it, 
So somebody makes a claim that something is true, if you can't, uh, uh, you know, falsify it, or at least, you know, hypothetically falsify it, then it's not a scientific proposition. Uh, but history itself doesn't totally work, as Gershon Korn is saying, uh, uh, through falsification, partly because there are too many variables. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a bit less certain uh, a way of using scientific method, but it is certainly approximating scientific method, and I think it is, uh, at least in some cases, uh, a necessary and extremely useful tool. So your toolkit of historical concepts and methods for this one-time bargain basement price of $19.99. Buy now and get a free set of classic car coasters for your dining room uh, 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 table, coffee table. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm losing my mind. It's late at night. So analysis of primary sources, uh, right? primary source documents. Uh, uh, we've talked about sifting through various interpretations, uh, understanding the messiness of interpretation. Placing things in context, 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 context. Looking for unintended consequences. Uh, history is rife with them. Uh, and uh, they oftentimes have... Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an important uh, a way to connect events uh, and to explain them over long periods of time in particular. Trying to start, so, uh, sort out issues of change and continuity, as difficult as it is, is... Uh, um, uh, unclear as it often remains, even with a great deal of thought by many brilliant minds uh, over the you know centuries or decades, the search for causes, consequences, meaning, and significance. Remember, think significance when you study. Uh, what's significant about this guy, this event? Uh, uh, the answer to that uh, might get you the right answer on the exam. The difficulties of presentism and judgment. Uh, our natural tendency to, uh, you know, assume that people in the past were thinking like us, and that they should think like us, and when they don't, uh, we wave the uh, finger at them and say, "Ah, you're a bad uh, person or bad group of people." I'm not saying, by the way, that's n it's never warranted to do that. Uh, I can't. I didn't say this earlier, but uh, I teach Western civilization as well as U.S. history, uh, and and I teach the second half of U.S. history as well. I can't lecture uh, about World War II and Adolf Hitler without making moral judgments uh, about the guy as being, uh, you know, an evil uh, uh, figure, monstrous figure in history. Uh, it's impossible for me not to make uh, moral con condemnations of Adolf Hitler. So I'm not saying you can't, uh, uh, and there's never, it's never, uh, uh, you know, a good thing to make uh, negative, uh, critical value judgments of historical figures or groups in the past. Uh, sometimes I think it is warranted. But we have to, I think, if we're going to study uh, and practice history responsibly, uh, we do have to take, I think, the issue of presentism seriously. Uh, uh, it, 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 it requires some responsibility uh, and some careful, careful thought. The problem of objectivity and bias. Obje objectivity is certainly desirable. A little bit of bias uh, might be inevitable in everybody. Uh, and a little bit is probably okay, but if uh, one uh, person, say, writing a book uh, on an historical subject is so biased, uh, let's say politically, ultra-conservative or ultra-liberal, that it mars his thinking and he's sort of blinded by that, then the, 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 the book that he writes or the article that he writes is probably less useful because it's so far away from objectivity. So the, the, I think the goal uh, should be objectivity uh, with the recognition that, that, that we're all human. It doesn't always work out that way. The uses of theory, models, patterns, categories, labels, comparisons, uh, speculation, uh, thought experiments, uh, uh, what if questions, uh, what if this had happened instead of that, where would the world be, uh, and uh, approximating scientific method. Uh, using scientific method and, and applying it with some changes to historical study. There it is. There's your toolkit. Study it. Go back to it. Uh, take the exam uh, by the end of uh, uh, whenever the look up, click on it. You'll see when it's due. Uh, and by all means, uh, mainly uh, uh, take this seriously when we go 
chapter by chapter, unit by unit, through the course, because many, if not all of these, are going to come up. Presentism will come up again and again. And so will some of the other ones. Some of them come up more than others. But uh, this is your toolkit. Uh, and you've got many tools here. Use them. Or, and if you don't know how, contact me. Talk to others. Uh, look it up. And, and uh, uh, become uh, fluent uh, in these terms, uh, in these concepts, uh, in these methods. And you'll do better in the class. See ya.